just a moment. Praise the name of the Lord. What an awesome looking crowd of folks you are today. I'm excited to see you in God's house. Amen. <clears throat> I want to remind you it's real important. Uh, the next couple of weeks, here's a real quick skinny. Are y'all ready? Next Sunday, uh, Pastor Frankie Tyson, he's a missionary to the country of Guatemala. He will be here with us on that Sunday morning. We're, we're going to have a great time with him. Let me give you a heads up. In October, that's down the road a little ways, but be here before you know it. My intentions is to take about eight or ten men and women, combined total eight or ten, with me to Guatemala to uh, rebuild a pastor's house. It's going to cost us some money to do that, but I believe that missions is at the heart of God. And while, yes, we could always find uh, things for money, uh, things to pay off, things to do, I don't think we can ever get so wrapped up in what we are doing here and, you know, building a little kingdom here at the harbor. God is concerned about all. Amen. So, Brother Frankie Tyson will be with us. And then the following two weeks after that, I will be preaching a mini-series on servolution where to help you get involved in serving God in a better way, in a deeper way, in a more meaningful way. Because it's only when we begin to put our hand to the plow and that we begin to do something with what God has done in our hearts and our lives, then we feel valuable and we find value in life and we find purpose and then that motivates us. And so we, we are more apt to live our life to the fullest Christian potential. So that, that's what's coming down the pike, and um, we're going to have a great time with it. <clears throat> but right now, I want us to look at part six. Uh, Till death do us part. I'm not going to read the verse again, but uh, what I do want to show you is that in Song of Solomon, it, it's uh, eight chapters. It's, it's a short book. It's filled with metaphor, allegory, um, symbolism, you've really got to look close at it to learn it and to understand it. But as we look through the first five, uh, or we involved ourselves in the first five messages in the series, we learn that Solomon knew how to maintain a relationship. We knew that Solomon knew how to treat a lady. We, knew, we found out that Solomon learned how to get mad. I'm not saying he'd done it 100% right, uh, because in one place he put his hand through the wall, and I don't want you to raise hands. Maybe some of you have done that. But nonetheless, he backed off. He retreated to the garden, and he went to pray and settled his spirit and his mind. So we learned that in the end, Solomon decided to work it out God's way, just like A.J. and Jordan. They're fussing, they're fighting, and they're feuding, and finally one reaches back and says, I'm sorry. The other one says, I'm sorry. Y'all will notice the man went first. I, I, any, I just want you to know that's, that was not in the notes. But Solomon had a way of making relationships work. He had this unique way because he was doing it God's way. He had character about him that attracted people to him. So as we've looked at all of these, and I don't want to go through it again, I, I just want to tell you today the main topic. If you, don't, if you can't, don't get anything else I say today, I want you to get this. We need to be committed to each other. Now, I know some of y'all need to be committed. But <laughs> we need to be committed to each other. Are you with me? Say amen. We need to be committed because sadly, uh, and most people don't realize this, but commitment would fix most of the problems in marriage if men and women were committed to each other. But everybody is looking for, what's this, a way out. Everybody wants an out. Now listen to me. Outs are important. Look at your neighbor and say, outs are important. Now let me tell you a, a situation when outs was important. Three, two or three weeks ago, I took a lot of our pastoral staff down to the Renegade Pastors Conference in Orlando, Florida. <clears throat> we had a great time. Now, while the ladies was out running the malls and shopping and doing whatever, us guys was at work all day long from 8 to 5. This is true. <laughs> no support, I see. But nonetheless, it is true. So, uh, but but uh, we decided that after the seminars every day and after the uh, schooling, whatever, that we would 
you know, go out to a nice dinner uh, or whatever, and, or maybe go to Fun Spot or whatever. So we had some fun, and we went and we, we ate at uh, Texas Roadhouse or something. And I don't know, but if you've been around me much, I don't normally ride anywhere. I ride in airplanes, but I drive trucks. I hardly ever go anywhere unless I'm driving because I don't want to be on nobody else's time schedule. If I got to go, I got to go. If I need to leave, I can leave. And I don't mind buying a little more gas to drive somewhere just because if I need to go, I need to go. And so that's just how I am. But somehow I got talked into getting in the back seat of my Suburban. Now, my Suburban is 47 feet long. No, I don't know if it's that long, but it's a long way to the back. Now, I'm claustrophobic. I hate to tell you all that, but that's, that's the thing that's got me. Heights don't bother me. I'm not worried about all that. But we had just ate this big old meal, and somehow I end up in the very back seat, and, and we got uh, me and Kelly and Ken and Tara and Adam and Chelsea and Josh and Ashley, and you understand, the Suburban's full. And somehow I am sandwiched back there. And man, it's cold outside, but I can't breathe. And, and finally, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I'm starting to shake a little bit. And I, I said, uh, man, y'all going to have to open some windows or something. Or I'm going to have to make another door back through here somewhere. Amen. I needed an out. I needed a way out. And uh, finally, Josh said, you want me to pull over so you can drive? And I said, no, 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 we ain't got to go but just a couple miles. But nonetheless, that, that's a good example of needing an out. I needed an out because I ain't no way I'd have drove. I'd have walked back home before I sat there the whole time. That's just how it is. But then there was another time back at the General Assembly in St. Louis. How many of you ever been to St. Louis? Let me see your hand. You've been to St. Louis. It's a beautiful place to visit. <laughs> I don't want to go to live. But nonetheless, I, I saw the arch, and I love heights anyway. And so I looked at the arch and said, whoo, wow. And then I, I saw that you could actually go up in the arch. And I thought, man, that's pretty cool. So we bought the tickets and paid the fare thereof. And, you know, we did our thing, and we got in line. And, man, I, I'm all excited about it until we got through the corridor where you start to load up. And when you start to load up, the door is about half of this mirror high. Y'all with me? And you got to scoot way down like that and get in, and they got little bitty stools like we got in our nursery. And you sit down on that little old bitty stool, and you have to duck your head, or at least I did, because now those who were vertically challenged could sit straight up. But nonetheless, I had to sort of duck my head, and man, they closed them doors. And all of a sudden, I start to hyperventilate a little bit. My heart starts to shake a little bit. And this is a little elevator that's going to take you all the way up in the arch, all the way up, and then get you out on a walk up there. You're enclosed, obviously. But anyway, I, I read a placard right here, and it said, Fine, $500 if you open this door. And that elevator was kind of like it was Ricky and rickety and all of that and I could see a little spiral staircase just outside the glass of that elevator door and I said to the crew that was with us I'm not sure who all my family was there and Dean and Lisa Cavins and, and I finally just laid my head over in Kelly's lap I said if this thing stops I'm going to open that door and walk down them stairs well that's going to be $500 I said it'll be the best $500 I ever spent because I need a way out are y'all with me? So don't call on me if you need to tunnel through something. Go, right, that's not me. Amen. Anyway, but there are times when outs are in order, but marriage is not one of those times. Now, I do understand the Bible gives us some biblical outs, but I'm going to tell you, we abuse that because uh, we, we take it to the nth degree, and um, I'll just tell you more about that in just a moment. Let me just say this. We have built an out... Um, Possibly to protect ourselves and our interests. When it comes to our work, we've built outs. When it comes to our relationships, we've built ourselves outs. Uh, when it comes to church, there's absolutely outs in that. What I'm saying is, nobody wants to commit. You see, people seem to be committed as long as you don't cross them. As long as you don't disagree with them. Now, listen, I'm going to need a little help from some of you, so you Christians every now and then shout amen. <laughs> we, we, uh, we're committed as long as we don't uh, get crossed, and we're committed as long as we don't get disgusted or don't get our way or we become uncomfortable. You see, we live in a world 
And let me say, sadly, in the church as well, and I'm not talking about just the harbor, this is churches in general. We live in a world and a church that says, don't challenge me, pastor. Don't challenge me to rise above status quo. Now, I, I, this is, involves your marriage, too, because we don't want to be committed in our marriage. We don't want to be committed in our church. We don't want to be committed in our finances. We want all that life has to offer. With We want all the goods and no commitment. High return, no commitment. That's what we want. And you see, don't challenge me. Don't, don't cramp my style, pastor. And listen, how dare I as a pastor hold a leader to his word or her word or commitment that they said I will uphold and do. They'll get mad and leave your church. If you remind them of a commitment that they signed and was glad when they ate donuts and, you know, served in class and said, hey, I'm good to go. Likewise, people say, I do, I do, and they're thinking about the honeymoon and not thinking about when the honeymoon's over and the bad breath and the dishes in the sink. And Are y'all with me? Say amen. Say, don't ask me to be accountable, pastor. We live in a world that don't want any accountability. We live in a world that gives every kid a trophy. We live, I mean, whether they won or not, whether they were in 10th place or 1st place, and while that might have a place in your mind, it is not sending the right message. Don't ask me to be accountable in my marriage. Don't ask me to be accountable on my job. It amazes me that a supervisor or the owner of a business has to go to someone and remind them again and again and again of what their job responsibilities are. And then they get mad when they finally have to reprimand them or write them up or let alone fire them because they would not do what they were overjoyed to do when they didn't have a job. They came to you oh, man, that's no problem. I could do that. That's no problem. I can even stay late if I need to. And then you ask them to stay late, and they've always got an excuse they can't. They don't want to be committed to the job. They don't want to be committed to the church. They don't want to be committed to their relationship. They don't even want to be committed to some of their friendships. You see, the questions that we always ask and answer anymore is, how can I get out if I don't like what I'm doing anymore? How can I get out if I get fed up with it? See, we want to make sure, like myself, if I'm looking into having to get into a tight spot, you can guarantee I'm looking, is there a way out? And see, that, that's okay for me to look at it like that way because I'm claustrophobic and I don't want to get in no tight spot. I didn't, this ain't no tight spot under this stage, but I sent other guys under here to pull this cable. Huh? I'll go up on the cross and paint it or whatever, but I ain't wanting to get under here. You understand what I'm saying? So um, we, we want to make sure we've got a way out, but nobody wants to be 100% committed to anything anymore, with the exception of they're 100% committed to their own hedonism. They're 100% committed to their own happiness. Whatever brings me the greatest joy, whatever brings me the greatest happiness, whatever gives me the greatest time on earth as I go around this one time, I'm 100% committed to that. Now, you see, in 1970, they introduced no-fault divorce. So now you can get a divorce and just say, hey, it's nobody's fault. Are you with me? People sign nowadays um, prenuptial agreements that says, if I decide to get out, you can't take what I have. Or, and they're worded differently, but uh, prenups. So in, other words, in other words, they're intending or they're making provision for something to happen and they have to execute or exercise a way out. It's quiet today. Now, you see, we need to learn how to make and keep. I'm, I'm going to try to help somebody today. If we learn how to make and keep our commitments... Starting with our marriage. Make your commitment to your spouse. And listen, if you're here today and you say, well, Pastor, you, you've already blown me out of the water because I done broke so many commitments. I done told so many lies. I don't have a friend in the world. I ain't even got a job. I don't have a church, etc." Listen, we're talking about from this day forward. At the very end of this, you're going to hear a song that says, from this moment on. Not, we ain't looking back. We're going to let God take care of the past. We're going to let God deal with all of that. But from today forward, because to him who knows to do good and don't do it, then it is sin to you. So, but we're going to say um, 
Commitment matters. And if you don't understand commitment, you'll never have a good relationship. If you don't understand commitment, you'll never have a good relationship with your wife. You'll never have a good relationship with your boss. You'll never have a good relationship with your friend. And you'll never have a good relationship with your church. But if you understand relationships, it's okay that me and Kelly don't always agree. It's okay that sometimes we discuss things. Hello? It's okay. There's nothing wrong with having an argument. They do it in court every day. They just have a judge, and then we, hopefully you don't have to get to that point, but they, they got a judge there that's going to rule who's in order and who's out of order. And I know sometimes at home, you know, you have to, you got to be grown up enough to let each other speak without running over each other and all that stuff. But you did make a commitment. You did say, till death do us part. Amen? Now, let me move on. You see, but your relationships are not going to get any better until you make a commitment to be committed. Now, um, again, don't throw yourself under the bus. I'm not throwing you under the bus. If you've messed it all up, listen. Hey, yesterday ended last night. Here, here, here's the deal. When we do a wedding, and uh, I, I've, I've done a fair share of them, it says, uh, do you, sir, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife, to live together after God's holy ordinance, uh, you know, in the holy estate of matrimony, to love her, to honor her, to keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep the only under her so long as you both shall live, and da 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 There may be a little bit more to that. And he says, I do. And then we ask her, and she says, I do. That's the question. And then you ask them to take hands and look into each other's eyes and repeat after me, I, Michael D. Saints, take thee, Kelly Renee Hall, to be my wedded wife. You know, and then I'm repeating it after the minister. Uh, to have and to hold from this day forward, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto her so long as you both shall live. I, uh, you know, and I repeat that. Therefore, um, uh, I pledge thee my undying love and all that stuff. Till death we do part. So we ask the question and they, they give us the answer. And then we ask them to repeat these vows after me. In other words, do you really understand what you're getting into? I want you to say it. Sometimes we have to hear it. Sometimes we have to hear it and see it. And then sometimes we have to hear it, see it, and say it. Huh? In other words, the ministers wanted to know, do you really, really know? Do you really know, understand till death do us part? Now, and then often ministers will join them together at the end and say, what God hath joined together. Let no man put asunder. So what we say, and we use symbolism, we say here's a wedding ring. It's made of precious stones and precious gold, uh, valuable things. And, and it's a circle and it never ends. Likewise, a marriage should never end. It should get more and more precious with time just as gold does. And we talk about those and the gemstones that's in them and how valuable and how precious and how, and, and precious and how rare. And, and we make that comparison and say, boy, she is precious. She is rare. And you look at him and say, oh, he is precious. And he is rare. And then he props his feet up and watches races. Ah, shh. Man, he's coming around turn two or whatever. Man, look at Ray. Oh, you know, and then they want to tell you about the dog is sick, about the time a big wreck happened in NASCAR. Y'all with me? And, and uh, or whatever. And maybe it's sports, uh, other sports for you. But nonetheless, um, we find ourselves doubting. Man, did we really make the right? Did we make the right decision? Did we really commit to this? Did I say I would love this? Did I say I would honor this? Did I would treat this above all else and never think about nobody else? And did I really say that? I must have been drunk. Huh? And then you go over to the wall, and there's a certificate, and I signed it. And the probate judge signed it, and it happened on this day. And, man, I said that. I'm committed to that. Are you with me? Say amen. Now, let me show you about Solomon because uh, time has a way of getting away. But in verse number 5, in verse number 5 of chapter 8, we're going to see Solomon here. And he's talking about... Uh, you know, or he, it's his relationship. And I just want to run through this, this and I, I need to get to... Uh, a part here and share it with you. It's the gold nuggets of this, this series. Uh, it says, Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Under the apple tree I roused you. There your mother conceived you. That word literally means under the apple tree is there where I aroused you. <laughs> 
Some of y'all don't want to like me getting down to the real seriousness of the Greek and the Hebrew, I can see. Under the apple tree that I roused you, there your mother conceived you. Now, mama wasn't there now. This was way back. Are y'all hearing me? There your mother conceived you. There she was in labor and gave you birth. Now, I want you to understand the meaning of that. And then she says, place me like a seal over your heart. Uh, like a seal on your arm. You know, we have um, bands. They used to, when I was in high school, they had leather bands, that little snap there, and then you put your name on it, and your best friend had one. Y'all exchanged them and all that kind of stuff, and that's, you know, kid stuff. Maybe your girlfriends or whatever. And some of you have had your girlfriend tattooed on your arm, and then you changed girlfriends. <laughs> you had to keep looking until you found one name to say. <laughs> I'm only teasing. <laughs> so, uh, but, but it says, put me like a seal on your arm, for your love is strong as death, and its jealousy undying as a grave. It burns like the blazing fire, like a mighty flame. This is real important. I want to explain these few verses here before we go any further. Notice this. Um, the apple tree was a place of passion where she had aroused him. She's admiring the fact, notice this from what I read to you out of that scripture, she's admiring the fact that he was born for her. He talked about his mother conceiving. He said, you were born for me. And she owns the fact that God created him for her. How many of you know that God knew who you would marry before you were born? That's right, Jeremiah. He says, before I was formed in my mother's womb, the Lord knew me and ordained me a prophet unto the nations. 29 and 11 of Jeremiah says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, good thoughts and not that of evil, to give you an expected end. God declares the end from the beginning. Now, you and I sometimes have gone astray and done things that God did not intend for us to do. That's called disobedience. Are you with me? And then we oftentimes had to pay the price for that. But she says, uh, she came to grips with the fact that they were made for each other. She says, place me like a signet or a seal. It, it, you know, a signet or a seal. Uh, like right now, we give rings as a token, a symbol of. She says, I want to be yours. Watch this. Y'all ain't going to like this, ladies. But I want to be owned by you. I can see some of y'all ladies, modern day, uh, you don't own me, brother. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Uh, it's hitting home, ain't it? He said, for love is as strong as death, and jealousy is unyielding as the grave. It burns a blazing fire like a mighty flame. Won't you see the interpretation of this? What she's literally saying is, love is as strong as death, and jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. It means only Death will separate us. Watch this. And it goes further. And may I go to hell if I break my vow. Wow. Now, I'm not saying God would send someone to hell if they'd been divorced. That's certainly not the case. But what she was saying, this was uh, saying that if, if, in other words, that's, that's her saying it her way. Her making a commitment and swearing, saying, and may this be done to me if I break this commitment, this vow. Now, let me show you the severity of it. How many of you believe in the symbolism? We do this at marriage. How many of you know the symbolism of marriage? What we do, we do a sand ceremony where the, the groom's parents come and they pour some colored sand in a vase in the middle. And then the bride's family, they come and they pour a little sand in the vase. And then after I marry them and they've said their vows, they each one go over and they get some colored sand and she pours a little in the vase and... He pours a little bit into vase, and you've got all these colors of sand, and it's beautiful, and it's all mixed together. Here's the power of the commitment. The sand ceremony literally means this. In, in old times, in Bible times, what they would do was they would do a sand covenant like that, or a salt covenant. And, and what, here's, the, here's the power of the commitment, the power of the symbolism of the commitment. It said, if I want to break my commitment, I've got to go in the jar and get every grain of my sand out. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that's not going to happen. In other words, if I'm willing to pour my sand in. <laughs> now, we did one of these at Pastor Appreciation Day one day. <laughs> I'm going to let you all figure it out now. <laughs> all I'm saying, there's a whole lot of grains of sand still in the jar. Amen. What I'm saying is, unless I get every grain of my sand out, I cannot break the commitment. Now, uh, so let, let me show you how serious they were at a Jewish wedding. At a Jewish wedding, they would slaughter an animal. They'd have a sacrifice. You know what they do? I mean, they slaughter these birds, 
and these animals, and they would lay the pieces of their bodies out here. Y'all with me? Did you see the symbolism? They lay the bodies out there, and then on this side, they would lay bodies. I mean, pieces. I mean, there's a leg, there's feathers, there's a wing, there's, I mean, there's laid out. And then the bride and groom would walk through the middle of those sacrifices saying, May it be done unto us just like them if this vow we break. If we break this vow, may we be sown asunder. Maybe we be, may we be cut into pieces as the sacrifice today has been. Do you understand the severity and the seriousness of commitment? So then we can work out little quirks in our relationships with people, with churches, with pastors, with bosses. Are y'all hearing me? I've had people come to me sometime, and boy, they got a problem. And then they go down the road, and they got a problem with this one. And then they find out they got a problem at work. And find out they got a problem over here. Find out they got a problem over there. And I just want to hold up a sign and say, you are the problem. <laughs> I felt that just sort of bounce back off the wall. But if it's good medicine, take it. What that says, if I got a problem with Jim and Joe and Bob and Sue and Sally and Jesse, Perhaps I'm the problem. Maybe I need to look into this mirror and say, what is wrong with me? Wow. So, did I just get through my introduction? Oh, Lord. Let me quickly give you four understandings that you've got to get to. The first understanding is this. If you're going to have a marriage that's going to last forever, you've got to understand that love is possessive. And I want to put that in context because I don't want you to think that you're possessing him like a pawn on a monopoly board or her. Pastor Chris Hodges told a story of a couple. And I'm going to tell you this story. It's a true story. Powerful story. He said a couple come to his office and the woman had committed adultery. And uh, they were at such an impasse that it, 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 it did not appear that it could be saved. Now, grounds, that is grounds for divorce, biblically speaking. So, I mean, he's justified if he wants to go. That's, that's fine. But they came and they said, look, maybe perhaps, I, I don't know. But they came and they, she had committed adultery. And by their, both their admissions, this is the only thing had happened in their marriage. He was faithful, but she had had this indiscretion, if you want to call it that. But nonetheless, he was adamant, Pastor Chris, this is not happening. I, I'm sorry. I know we're members of the church, and you require us to come to counseling before we have, um, you know, a divorce or separation like that. But, but this isn't going to work. I've got biblical grounds. I'm out. He said, okay. I'm sorry that you can't work it out. And, uh, you know, wife goes out and crying down the hall. And, and he, he turns back, and he says, but, Pastor, he said, before we go, he said, I, I do want to ask you something. Does the church have... A ministry to help addicts, uh, drug addicts, uh, alcoholics. Oh, he said, yeah. Uh, he said, we've got two or three um, of our groups that deal with that, and we've got counselors on staff. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, well, why do you ask? He said, well, I've got a brother. That he's been addicted to uh, drugs for years and years and years. He said, I, I, end up, I end up paying his rent all the time. I end up paying his car payment sometimes. He'll get clean, he'll do all right for a little while, and then he'll go, he'll go back and he'll just mess up. And, 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 you know, he's down on one of them times again. And, I, you know, I'm trying to put up with him and trying to pay his bills and trying to find him a job and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and Pastor Chris looked at him and said, ladies already out of the way, and he said, may I ask you a question if you don't mind? He shuts the door and he says, it's amazing to me that you can be so concerned about your brother by your own admission that has done this to you over and over and over and over again for 20 some odd years, and yet you keep on forgiving him and paying his bills and finding him jobs and helping him get a car and get back on his feet, but your wife, by your admission and hers, has had this one indiscretion, although it is bad, not to diminish it nor to justify it, but you're willing to throw her away right now. And by all means, you do have biblical grounds. I mean, if someone commits adultery, you do have biblical grounds. But, he, but he's trying to make the comparison. And the guy spoke up and said, well, hey, wait a minute. My brother's blood. And, uh, you know, the pastor just said, you know, that, that's a pretty weak argument, your, your brother's blood. You mean to tell me, like, for instance, I have Adam, I have Carly, AJ, and Andrew, 
And, and though Kelly and I were not blood kin, obviously, but we got married, two became one. We became a union and produced the offspring of our children and now three grandchildren. And what he's asking this man is, you're willing to forgive this brother of yours that has abused your love, he's abused your kindness, he's abused you again and again and again, and you will forgive him and forgive him and forgive him, but you throw her out like trash because she made this one mistake. And I thought it was a pretty powerful analogy. That's why I want to share it with you. I'm not saying that he didn't have biblical grounds. He did. But it's, it, it's, it's worth considering you know, and then in verse 7, let's pick up verse 7 there, till death do us part. And verse 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. In other words, you can't buy love. Huh? You cannot buy love. <laughs> I had a pastor friend of mine said, uh, that, he said, the bottom line is, someone could offer me a thousand dollars for my wife, and I would say, not on your life, and I'd almost be ready to fight just because they even ask. He said, and then they would offer me ten thousand dollars, and I'd say, are you out of your mind? And he said, they would offer me ten million dollars, and I would say, are you out of your mind? Let me at least think about it till dark. <laughs> I'm only teasing there. So, but he says, you cannot buy love. You cannot buy love. Now, so lasting love is possessive. <clears throat> uh, I want you to understand lasting love, secondly, is persevering. Lasting love is persevering. And in other words, it's enduring. It's forbearing. It's long-suffering. It keeps on going. It keeps on giving. Are, are y'all hearing me? That's what, it, it, it's, it's persevering. It, 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 it takes commitment to honor the vows that you made. Let me tell you a true story from one of our own. Some of y'all know Al and Diane Rowland. Al has gone on to be with the Lord now. He's a great friend of mine. And um, he and Diane was here the very first day Kelly and I moved into the church, the old church there. And uh, she stopped by my office because of me preaching this Death Do Us Part series and said, I'd like to share something. And whether you feel led to share it or not, it doesn't matter. But I did feel led to share it, so I wrote it into my notes. And here it is. Some of you knew Al and Diane. We were married in 1975. Al was shot by a high-powered rifle right in the stomach in 1978, only three years after marriage. Diane said this caused our love to grow through the years, and we truly became one. We started loving what each other loved. She said, I love to shop, and Al loved to fish. And so sometimes I would go shopping, and he would go fishing. Are you with me? She said, um, in 1989, he got worse. Having been shot with a six or seven millimeter magnum, I can't remember which, but nonetheless, it just blew his intestines to pieces. And finally, in 1989, they had to take all of his intestines out. Now, some of you nurses could tell us how long your intestines are, and it's long. But they had to take it all out but about 15 uh, feet or so. Uh, I mean, just very little left. And... Uh, so that left him in a condition that any time he ate, it just went right through him. It also left him in a condition that it was no longer, let, let me just be frank and blunt, we, it, it, it's diarrhea every time. Are you with me? But they'd made a commitment. She said we loved each other more and more and more. He only had, he had 15% is what it was, not 15 feet. 15% of his bowel left. They left him in that situation uh, that I've mentioned to you in every episode, every episode, every time he had to go to the bathroom, whether it was day or night, oftentimes he would have to be bathed, cleaned up, redressed, sheets changed, covers changed. And I don't know if you know uh, Stephen Smith, who is uh, the undertaker here, the uh, mortician. I know him personally. I've done several funerals with him. And when Al died, Stephen came to Diane and said to Diane, said, you must have really loved him. You have taken great care of him. How would one know that? He said, well, I know this because when I do the embalming, his backside and bottom and all of his, his skin looks so good. He was taken care of. He was not left to sit in that 
over and over and on and on. But he was taken care of. And so she asked him, would it be possible at the funeral, after I had preached that funeral, if she could be the one to actually close the casket and lock it down for the last time? And they granted that request. And uh, we had, I'll never forget the day I preached his funeral. In fact, I wore one of his ties to preach his funeral that day. And uh, just a great man and woman of God. Let me say to you, sir, ma'am, the grass is not always greener. The grass is not always greener on the other side. And if the grass seems to be greener, someone has perhaps painted the grass. On the greener side, the water bill is definitely much higher. And usually there's a lot of manure around because somebody has spread fertilizer. Greener grass takes harder work, you see. And then, let me try to finish this up. Uh, in, in the series here, in verse 8, Solomon turns his attention now and he talks, because I talked about love being possessive and love persevering. He talks about his little sister and he says, and this is going to harken back to some of our days gone by. He said, we have a little sister whose breasts are not yet grown. She was most likely preteen. He says, if she is a wall, that means if she has kept herself chaste, if she has kept herself, then we will build for her a battlement of silver. If she has been a door, that literally meant next. Who's next? If she has been unchaste, unkept, acting a fool, if she lived through it, they said, we will close her in with boards of cedar. That's what he was saying. And, and you got to get to this. I, I didn't want to take the time to do it, but you got to understand this. Verse 10, uh, the Bible lets us know love, lasting love is not only possessive and persevering, it is protective. It is protective. Now I want you to notice what Solomon's wife says. I am a wall. I hadn't been here and there and like a swinging door. My breasts are like towers. Thus I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. Verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard in Belhaman. Watch this. You've got to catch this. Remember where in, when we started this, her brothers, her brothers made her go work in the field. And she was aggravated, saying, my skin looks like leather. I'm dark, and I'm all of this because I, my hands are cast. I've been working. I can't be beautiful. I hadn't been laying in the tanning bed, and I hadn't been down with oil of Olay and been to Jill's salon or whatever. I've been in the field working. My brothers made me go work. She said, but Solomon had a vineyard in Belhaman. He let out his vineyard to tenants. Guess what now? Each was to bring his fruit, a thousand shekels of silver, but my own vineyard is mine to give. Now she's talking about her own body. The, the thousand shekels are for you, Solomon. Two hundred are for those who tend its fruit. Watch this, verse 13. You will dwell in the gardens with friends and attendants. Let me hear your voice. Here's what I want you to understand. Here's what my study revealed. Solomon actually owned that vineyard. <laughs> Her brothers were the tenants in that vineyard. Her brothers were the ones that was working that vineyard. And had they not made her go to work, she would have never met Solomon. I, I, my mind went back to someone by the name of Ruth. Had she not been poor and had to go glean in the fields, she would have never met Boaz. Are you with me? And Boaz met her, fell in love with her, married her, redeemed her. And then you know the story. That put this foreign woman in the lineage of Jesus. For Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David, and David Solomon, and Solomon Rehoboam, right on down to Jesus. What I'm saying is God knows what he's doing. So when we say, till death do us part, and we hold on to it, and we hang on to our commitment, we'll find out that lasting love is protective. Lasting love is peaceful listen and let me say it like this the only way you can learn to love like this is to accept someone who knows how to love like this I'm not talking about your boyfriend or girlfriend 
The only way you can have what I've given you this series is to know the author of love. For God is love. Amen? God is love. He that loveth not don't know God. For God is love. Amen? God is love. How much do you love me, Lord? And he sent his son to die for us. Inasmuch as while we were steeped in sin, Christ died for the ungodly. He who knew no sin became sin for you and I, nailing it to his cross. That we might live. I came to give you life. That you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I want you to really live. For you were not redeemed with the blood of bulls and goats. But you were redeemed by the precious blood of a spotless lamb. John the Revelator said slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. Oh, how he loves me. Know how he loves you. And so I can love Kelly like that's why he said, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands in the fear of God. How can he say that? Why? He can say it because he taught us how to love. He can say it because he's the author of the marriage commitment and the covenant. First Corinthians says this, and then we're going to pray. If I speak with tongues of men and angels and do not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that I could move a mountain but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give my body to, to, uh, to hardship that I may boast, but I have not love, then I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind, it does not deny or it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, they'll be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. For now we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness has come, when Jesus has come again, what is in part will disappear. For when I was a child, I talked like a child. And I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Put childhood behind me. For now we only see as a reflection in a mirror. But then... We will see face to face. I know now in part, but then I shall know fully as I'm fully known. Now there abide these three, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. What I want to do is I want to pray a simple prayer, and then we're going to play a song. But I, I, I want to ask you, I think it's important while I'm praying this prayer for all of our married couples to come and stand with me in this altar. I, I just cannot, I know because of crowd and because of this, that, and the other, we say, well, I, I don't know about that, but I, I, I think it's great. I think it's a great step of faith. As I'm praying this prayer right now, I want all of our married couples to stand, just come all the way to where my feet are, all the way at this altar. Come on. So I get ready to pray this prayer. Listen, and if this fills up, then there's three aisles. I just want you to stand as couples as far back as you have to go to make it right. Okay? I thank you for indulging me and for coming. As you're coming now, I'm going to pray a prayer. And we're going to transition to a song that we're going to play over the media for you to hear as we uh, embrace our spouses. And um, I'm going to ask Kelly if she's out there to come. There she is. As I'm praying, if you're a married couple, I want you to come, if you will. If your spouse is here with you, I want you to come. Let's pray together. Father, I pray now for these marriages. I pray, Lord. For this love story series, God, I have preached it the way you've laid it on my heart. 
I've been inspired by so many pastors. I've been inspired by so many people. I've been touched by the comments that they've made. Lord, I've been touched by the changes that you've made in their lives. And as they make their way down here right now, I pray, God, that you would help us to see this commitment. Lord, it is a commitment that we make together where we say, I'm totally committed to you for the rest of my days until I die, till death do us part. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you, if you were to take your spouse, embrace him or her.